Hello and welcome back to Codex Lee. My name is Lee and this is a channel all about books. So today I am going to focus on a book called Black and British, A Forgotten History by David Olusoga. Uh, and this is based on his uh, BBC TV series that aired a few years ago. The first thing to note about this book is that it spends a lot of time focusing on pre-war uh, black British history, that is to say, black British history prior to the Second World War. Uh, and this points to two of the central themes of Olaf Sugar's book. The first being that there were black communities living in Britain prior to the arrival of the um, Empire Windrush. The place of black people in British history is sometimes thought of as a story that begins with the arrival of the Windrush. In reality, the Windrush is just one chapter in a much longer history. Olusoga also talks about the fact that the Windrush myth, quote, perpetuates the notion that black British history is exclusively a history of black settlement in Britain, rather than a global survey of Britain's interaction with Africans on three continents. And this is one of the eye-opening points about this book, is it spends as much, if not more, time outside of Britain than it does um, within Britain, looking at this particular history because he's trying to show that the history um, of black people, of black Britons, is as much about people living in countries that were affected by the actions of the British uh, as it is concerned about uh, black people living in the British Isles. So really, um, just as the history of black people in Britain doesn't begin with Windrush, um, sadly the history of British white supremacy doesn't end with the abolition of slavery either. Olusoga actually opens the book talking about um, his own experiences growing up as uh, a mixed race child in Britain in the, I think, 1960s or 1970s and being subjected to racism, um, being basically, his family basically driven out of their own home because of racist attacks. And I think that this perspective is, is really valuable because it reminds us that white supremacy continues to affect the lives of so many growing up in Britain in recent years and t today to this very day. And it emphasises how Olusoga's um, history as a black man in Britain is a uh, part of the wider history that he proceeds to narrate. The history of slavery, of British, uh, the British involvement in slavery, has focused too much on the abolition of slavery as opposed to the horrors of the slave trade itself and Britain's involvement in that trade. Uh, I'm quoting from the book here. Half of all the Africans who were carried into slavery over the course of the 18th century were transported in the holds of British ships. There are many, many stories that he discloses in this book. Um, some of them might be quite well known, but they weren't very well known to me, to my shame. Um, for example, the shocking case of the Zong. This was a slave ship where um, supplies... The, the, the ship got lost. It was carrying hundreds of slaves. It got lost. Supplies were lower than was ideal. Um, and in order to deal with the situation, um, the captain of the ship decided to throw sick slaves overboard. I think in the end over a hundred slaves were thrown overboard and this wasn't some kind of um, sudden event, this was done systematically over the course of several days. Uh, and on that point about the horrors of the slave trade, the book um, actually opens uh, with Olusoga describing the, um, the fort at Bunce Island in Sierra Leone, through which so many countless Africans passed on their way to a life of slavery um, in the Americas. He describes in particular a brick building at the fort, um, which has mystified um, historians. They haven't been entirely clear what was the purpose of this um, this brick building. Olusoga describes it as, in all probability, a rape house. Uh, we can't be sure that was its purpose, but it's highly likely that many of the, the slave women um, were sexually assaulted and that there may have been a purpose-built facility to carry this out. It's really horrific. It's one of many horrific facts that he relays that it is important to read about um, so that we stop telling ourselves that the history of slavery in Britain um, is really all about the abolition of slavery. This is the true horror of what was happening. He actually stays in Sierra Leone for quite some time. He, he spends a lot of time talking about Sierra Leone, 
and it helped me to appreciate the kind of real British roots of Freetown, the modern capital of Sierra Leone, and really how the founding of Freetown, it really begins with um, the black loyalists. Um, so these were, um, I think, mostly previously enslaved um, black people in, um, in America who fought on the side of the British during the American Wars of Independence. Uh, and they were told that, you know, that the British would guarantee their, their freedom. Um, but they weren't, they were treated quite poorly. Um, many of them were sort of shipped up to Nova Scotia uh, in Canada. And then from there, uh, many of them were shipped on to Sierra Leone, where the idea was to start a new uh, town, a new colony of um, freed black slaves. So they basically, they was they were brought her to, to Sierra Leone, to Bunce Island, where they were packed into a slave ship, taken to the Americas, and then descendants of these people um, then returned to Sierra Leone to set up um, their own community. And this was encouraged and um, supported to an extent by the British, and even by some British um, abolitionists who really wanted to see this thing succeed. But predictably, most of these people died um, from disease and starvation. Um, but there were um, successive waves of black British uh, people who uh, were brought, uh, they, were, they were very poor black British people who lived in London, many of them were homeless. And people didn't like to see these homeless black British people, many of whom had fought on behalf of the British. So they were shipped off uh, to uh, Sierra Leone as well. And it speaks to the very inauspicious beginnings of the very, as I said, the very British roots of the modern city of Freetown. Um, if you just look at the names of many of the streets and suburbs of Freetown in Google Maps today, you will see what I mean by this. So that was a fascinating and troubling part of history that I just knew nothing about. Of course, um, we shouldn't forget that you can, that you could have been an abolitionist at this time, uh, but still be racist. I'm quoting from the book here, no matter how difficult it is for us to understand, the fact remains that many millions of Victorians who, like their famous author, Charles Dickens, passionately opposed slavery, saw no contradiction between their op opposition and an unshakable belief in black inferiority. Um, so as I said earlier, we can and should push back against the narrative that, um, centralizes Britain's abolition of the, of the slave trade at the expense of the facts about how it dominated that trade for so long, some of the facts that I've already talked about. But equally, we should recognize um, the British efforts that went into disrupting that trade once it was no longer a participant. Um, for example, um, the Black Jock. This was a former slave ship that was captured by uh, the British Navy. And then um, they then used that ship to later um, liberate um, black slaves. And it famously liberated 466 Africans from the hold of the Spanish slave ship, the um, Almirante in 1829. Uh, and these 466 Africans, uh, but those who did survive, um, they were noted down in uh, what was called the Registers of Liberated Africans, um, which denoted um, their names and, and sort of, I think, where they came from and some of the um, their physical characteristics. And this is a book which Olusoga, um argues restored individuality to the um, recaptured slaves who populated Freetown because many of them they couldn't or wouldn't go back to where they were taken from they stayed in Freetown and added to the existing population um, who had um, been taken there by the British from uh, Nova Scotia and from the streets of London. Moving on he then um, talks about the remarkable story of Sarah Forbes Bonetta. Um, she was an African girl who was given as a gift to a British diplomat when she was just a child. Um, he brought her back to Britain and she met Queen Victoria and um, she was actually brought into the, under the care of Queen Victoria. She then resides and marries in Brighton and uh, she had a daughter who she named Victoria um, and this daughter was provided for by the Queen um, after her mother's death. Uh, a really interesting figure. There are so many interesting individuals in this that he talks about that I'd love to learn more about and Sarah Forbes Bonetta is one of those. Now, moving on to the end of the 19th century, uh, I really enjoyed reading about Karma, Sabele I, and Bathion. These were three kings of what is today Botswana, and they toured Britain in 1895 because the uh, imperialist Cecil Rhodes was um, conquering large parts of um, the southern part of the African continent, and they were there land was, uh, their kingdom was basically next in line as part of uh, Rhodes' colonialist exploits. So the two had Britain in order to, to go on a sympathy for um, retaining, um, if not their independence, then at least um, 
to come under the um, the quote unquote care, if you like, of the British. Uh, in any case, they succeeded, uh, and as Olusoga puts it, the protectorate remained under direct British administration until 1960, when it became the modern state of Botswana. Uh, and this is a narrative, and, and Olusoga doesn't talk about this, but this is a narrative that extends into the life of Karma's uh, grandson. Um, who was uh, actually exiled by the British um, from his homeland, uh, I think during the 1950s, because um, he married a white woman, an English woman, and the British didn't like this, so they exiled him. Uh, and he later, but he did later become the, fa the first president of um, the freed country of Botswana. Uh, and there's a film that was made about this, which I think was called A United Kingdom, um, which I haven't seen, but I'd really like to. Queen Victoria. The man who negotiated for her protection of Bichwana land. He was my grandfather. A king. I am his heir. Oh, I see. So this, this whole history um, that spans many decades, uh, Botswana, is really fascinating. And then we come up to the 20th century. Um, so there are incidents that occur both in 1919 after the end of the First World War and in 1948 after the end of the Second World War. Um, the black communities in Liverpool in 1919 and in 1948 came under organised attacks from mobs. Uh, and these mobs sometimes numbered in the thousands, um, which just beggars belief. The response was that the victims of this violence, so these black members of these of the black community, uh, were themselves uh, arrested, uh, and sometimes the consequence consequences of, of these arrests was that some of these people were um, later killed by uh, by the mobs. One of these being Charles Wooten, um, the lynching of Charles Wooten in 1919, is described by Ola Shoka in this book. It's shocking, and it led to, uh, as he puts it, into intergenerational distrust of the police by the black community that lingered into the 1980s. Um, this is one of the legacies of the, the actions of not just these um, white communities who um, you know, perpetuated this violence, but the response from the authorities as well, which made it even worse. And Britain, in a way, is, you know, is still dealing with the legacy of these actions uh, to this day. So there you go, those are just some of the things I took from this book and some of my responses for it. It's a brilliant book. Um, this, this, there are just far more um, histories of people and events in this than I could possibly um, discuss in this video. Uh, I highly recommend that you read it. I hope this has given you a good sense of what is included. Uh, this is undoubtedly a five-star book for me. Time and again, over and over again, the story of Africa and Africans has been very central to British history. So black British history isn't a marginal subject that is only about and only of interest to black people. It is British history. It's at the center of our story, and most importantly of all, it's a shared history. It's a story of interaction, and it's a story that belongs to all of us.